wanted to set uh, if you wanted to set a book in kind of cowboy country where there are a lot of ranches and stuff, where would you go? And he said, well, uh, actually what I do is I go down to Waco and ask the county clerk down there where to go. And he goes, there are a lot of ranches sort of in that countryside there. It's not too far away. I didn't want to go too far. So I went down to the Waco uh, county clerk and I said, you know, if you wanted to do ranch country, rich guys, you know, who are kind of like... Uh, you know, looking for, you know, buying ranches and stuff like that and kind of rich guy ranches. Where would you go? And he said, well, you had a this little town down south of here. So I went to the town down south of there, and the story was about, I can't even remember it because it was so long ago, but it was about a corrupt politician and all this kind of stuff going on. And uh, and this town was so small, it only had one store in it, which was the Dairy Queen. And uh, it was right at the intersection of these places. And so I wrote all this description about these ranches and towns and all. Uh, and the book came out, and about a week later, George Bush bought a ranch there. <laughs> It was so, and so actually it was before the book came out. It was after I'd finished it, but then the book hadn't come out yet. And then George, the second George Bush, bought a ranch there at Crawford, Kentucky, Crawford, Texas, excuse me. And uh, I mean, that's a weird coincidence because because when if people read the book, they say he's got to be talking about George, you know, because I, I, uh, I named the town and the corrupt politician, all this kind of stuff. It had nothing nothing to do with it. It was just out of the entire state of Texas, I wound up in the same town, which had only a Dairy Queen that 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 George Bush II uh, wound up in. Oh, you're just proving that life follows fiction, right? <laughs> Works that way. So, Patrick, is it 7 o'clock? Are you going to turn us on? You already turned us on. Well, in that case. It's, it's, it's 7.02. <laughs> right. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for coming to our birthday party. It's actually tomorrow is the 34th birthday. It's hard to imagine back in 1989. Wow. <laughs> And we're still here, which is even more important, but um, it's thanks to you all. So really appreciate your support and coming out and appreciate John. We, we were at dinner trying to, you made some extravagant claim. We haven't actually done this together 60 times, but probably 30, maybe more. More than that, because there have been more than 30 prey books, and I've come here for the other ones, too. Well, that's true. Not to mention, not the kid, I think. No, we did one kid. We did the fourth kid. We've done all the Virgils. The fourth kid probably came, the fourth kid probably came out sometime in the early 90s. Right. Right. And then I remember asking John why that was sort of the end of the kid, and it was because keeping up with the technology had become really difficult and um and today, it would be almost impossible to, the technology is moving so fast that, you know, I tried to figure out what is Elon Musk actually doing? I read today that he was interfering with something in the Mediterranean, like, um, was it Greek? I'm trying to remember. Some, some go, no, it was some Germany, German ships in the Mediterranean doing life-saving or something. And I thought, why? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, money, money, money. Yeah, it really is. And there's um, some interesting theories about whether, in point of fact, it's not really nations anymore, but major corporations, especially tech. Tech corporations are really running the world. And, you know, government, although looking at our government, one can assume they're not actually running the country either. So, yeah, <laughs> what can I say? All right. No so, politics. Mm, sorry. <laughs> Well, I was really thinking about it because we flew home from Quebec on Saturday and we were going to get here just before at 11 something or other if the government had dropped its funding. The question was, you know, if we were flying home on Sunday, whether we could actually fly because the TSA, all those people, you know, suddenly would not be employed. So, I mean, it had a real time, real time question for us, but as it happens, we managed to get here. So we are talking tonight about Judgment Prey. Love the title. Do you do you decide what, what book goes with, what word goes with Prey, or is that a function of marketing at your beloved That's as a function of marketing. Uh, I, I've never thought of a single uh, Prey title by myself. I've suggested some, and uh, generally they're rejected. Uh, for the... <laughs> 
for the for the book that I'm doing uh, the b book that I'm doing next year, I suggested viral prey uh, because it has to do with viruses, and uh, they rejected it. And uh, it's going to be what did I say it was going to be? I can't remember. There were there were a couple of different titles uh, that that uh, they came up with, and they chose one of them. And uh, but they rejected my suggestion, and uh, and their suggestions were actually better. So uh, it's not really a problem. I live in fear that one day I'm going to pick up a thing and it's going to be called Final Prey. <laughs> so I really don't want to see that title, John. <laughs> well, you know, they, they tell me, the marketing people tell me that there's that's not going to happen. And they're, and they're going to also tell me that I'm never, never going to kill off Davenport. I can't have Davenport get killed. Well, the, the reason for that is because people would stop, once they knew what happened to Davenport, they would never read the earlier books. And and uh, actually, the earlier books make a lot of money for the publisher uh, because they... Hopefully the, for the author. Not so much, really. Really? No, because we get paid up front. And, oh. and a lot of the time, you know, and it's because we got to make that back. But at any rate, uh, what happens is that the publishers... Uh, they get to a point where all they have to do is push a button in a factory someplace, start shooting out hundreds of books, and then they take them, distribute them to all the Barnes and Nobles and stores like this, and and um, and it costs them nothing essentially, you know, a buck a book or something like that, and then they sell them for some enormous inflated price, and and I don't get any of that money because I've been paid up front, so that's that's the way it works basically. <laughs> right. I said, yeah, well, that was a depressing. <laughs> Sorry, I went down that rabbit hole. Okay. Let's move back to Judgment Prey. All right. So one of the um, one of the things I really like about Judgment Prey is, you know, Lucas has been um, moving around in his role as U.S. Marshal. So he's been in various locations. But here we are back in the Twin Cities. We are in St. Paul and Minneapolis. So did you decide it was sort of a homecoming book? Mm -hmm. it, it was uh, a homecoming book. And also I had the problem of the Davenport and Virgil Flowers had both been badly shot up in the previous book. And, and you know, to have them running marathons in this one wouldn't have worked out very well because Davenport had been actually shot three times um, and once right through the chest. And so... Uh, so he in this book he's still kind of in a recovery mode at the beginning of the book when it starts. Uh, he, he's trying to run, but it's it's hard because he was shot both in the legs and and through the chest. And um, and, and contrary to what you see in the in the movies where somebody you know recovers from that in a matter of hours, uh, it actually takes a while to get over getting shot in the chest with a rifle. Uh, so um, so. Uh, that's one of the reasons I kept them in the Twin Cities. Also because um, I thought it was time to go back there for a while after rounding around Texas and, and Florida. Although the next book, the one that I'm just trying to finish now, uh, is set in New Mexico. So that's also outside the Twin Cities area. Well, um, so we have a jurisdiction question, which is if, you know, if he's now a U.S. Marshal, how is he getting assigned to work a, a local murder? You mean in the Twin Cities? Because that's where he's stationed. He works out of the Twin Cities office. Okay, but I didn't know that U.S. Marshals got to work the kind of case that you have written about. So isn't there an, an interesting... I'm trying to get back into local politics mm -hmm. here because there is a reason why Davenport is working this case. Yes. Uh, well, a reason for the Davenport is working all of these cases is because it's a, essentially a political deal that he has uh, kind of a semi-corrupt political appointment as a deputy U.S. Marshal. Uh, it was fixed through a couple of senators uh, who, uh, senators uh, appoint, uh, every state has got a, at least one and sometimes more U.S. Marshals. There's one U.S. Marshal per state. But under them are all these deputy U.S. Marshals. And the deputy U.S. Marshals are really the people who do stuff. The, the U.S. Marshals, like a postmaster or uh, is a political appointee. And, and uh, what, what they did was they got Davenport uh, because they owed him. A couple of U.S. Senators owed him. They got him this appointment in which they said, just keep your mouth shut. Help us out when we need it, and do what you want, and and so that's his deal. And what he wants to do is he wants to hunt people that are hard to catch, 
that's just what he does for a living and that's what makes him happy and and so he takes advantage of it and every once in a while one of these senators will come along and they'll say we've got a problem you've got to fix it and and sometimes the fixes are semi-corrupt and Davenport does it anyway because he likes to keep his job uh, in I, there's a couple books back three or four books back uh, it turned out that the, that a, a, a really serious, ugly problem that involves some killings uh, was touched off by uh, a young woman, the child of a U.S. senator, who who set up a phony website uh, that all of a sudden caught a lot of attention from crazy people, and they killed somebody, including a young child. Uh, and Davenport covered that up uh, in the end, although he, the, the killers were caught, of course, because the, they get, tend to get caught in my book most of the time. And and uh, but but uh, so Davenport is not entirely clean. Okay, and also if he's going to work with Virgil in this book, Virgil, in fact, he is operating in Minnesota, right? Virgil, yes. Can't necessarily well, Virgil still works for the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension in right. Minnesota. Right. So, what is the crime that touches off the investigation and judgment, Frey? Uh, you know, the, one of the things we can't talk about too much in this for people who haven't read the book is what the solution is or, or what happens. I wasn't going there. Good. I mean, I mean you know, because that sort of because once there's a crime that takes place, which is pretty horrendous, uh, 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 a killer enters the house of a uh, federal judge, murders the judge and his two young children. Uh, and there's a third person in the house, a baby, who is not killed. But the two kids get murdered, along with the father, uh, shot down in a really brutal way. And the question is, why? Uh, and there's an answer to this, which is, should be obvious, but isn't. And and uh, it's sort of a tricky thing, and and um, maybe you'll figure it out, and maybe you won't before we get to the end of the book. But but it, so there's sort of a mystery involved here that takes them a while to to solve. Okay, so he's a federal judge, um, and so when this killing goes down, the judge's wife is not home, um, and the baby is is spared. But obviously, when Virgil and Lucas come in to investigate, all the attention is focused on the judge, right? So that gives us a chance to excavate his cases and, you know, look for people who might might have wanted to kill him. And as the judge, um, there are probably a lot of people that actually wanted to kill him. So, um, And a lot of them, you know, are, are in prison. Some of them have just gotten out. The question is sorting through them because, you know, like... Uh, this isn't giving away too much, but one of the guys that they're looking at used to be a gun dealer, and and uh, and he's probably a, sort of a shady gun dealer. He was a private gun dealer. He didn't he didn't have a store or anything like that. He just dealt guns. Uh, and the question is is uh, you know what was his involvement in this whole thing? And he's been out of he's been out of jail not for very long, and his wife seems sort of pathetic. And there's just a lot of kind of complications like that. Um, that that kind of are piled onto the mystery. This is probably as close as I've come to writing a mystery, actually, rather than a straight-up thriller. It's kind of an Agatha Christie thing, in a way, you know, but it's a very wide net because a judge hears so many cases and, you know, it could reverberate back for years. So I thought it was, um, it takes a lot of information gathering in a case like this. It took a lot of resources to be looking at, you know, people that he might have sentenced or people who would be angry with him or whatever. Meantime, his wife is involved in a local charity. So, you know, there's, um, as you all know, there are potential charity scams everywhere. So a question is whether the, the charity is legitimate or whether there might be something weird going on there. Um, and and uh, I, I will tell you right up front that I think, and I knew this at the time I wrote the book, that some of the people were not going to like their end of the book. They, they don't like the ending of the book. They don't like the conclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, tough shit. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> It, 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 the, the thing is, is that uh, the thing is, is that um, is that I like it, and I think a lot of people will like it, but I think some people won't like it. And um, you know, uh, we'll discuss that when you're here next time. Yeah. <laughs> we can have a poll. How many people hated the ending of Judgment Frey? <laughs> I don't I mean, think people not. will hate it. They will think it doesn't follow, uh, which is different than hating it. So well, that's true. 
Yeah, that is true. Well, there's a psychological element to the book, too, which I forgot. The psychological element is what leads to the conclusion of it. And, and uh, some people may think that's too tenuous, but it's not tenuous if you're talking about somebody who's nuts. So, so moving away from the plot, which <laughs> I think would be a really good idea, since we're back in the Twin Cities, this is a chance for weather, uh, Lucas's wife, to have a voice. And Lenny, who, as you know, has had now two books of her own, um, Letty is in the picture, but we also have Virgil, and Virgil doesn't actually live in the Twin Cities, does he? He lives somewhat south, and Virgil, if you've been reading the Virgils, which I truly love, has an interesting um, family relationship, <laughs> let me put it that way, right. Um, so part of this is Virgil's going back and forth, right, trying to keep up with the family at home and Right. Up with the Virgil now has uh, twins, and uh, young twins, and um, with his girlfriend, and uh, she has had five or six other children, all by different men, um, and so she she's got kind of this odd reputation, uh, but she's pretty okay, and she fits with with uh, Virgil okay. I'm I, my I've got a number of problems that I'm going to have to solve if I write another Virgil book. I'm sort of coming to the end of my career. We have, we had talked about this at dinner, and I am thinking I'm, I'm going to go to like one book a year, but what book do I go? Do I do a Letty? Do I do a Pray? Do I Virgil Flowers book? Um, I haven't figured that out if I go to one a year. Uh, but I've got an idea for a Virgil Flowers book called Virgil Quits. And what was your, what, what was your, what was your, no, it was, uh, it was Patrick. What was, Where's Patrick? What was Patrick's title? It was uh, uh, Two Weeks Notice. I think it was what it was. Yeah, That's it. yeah. No, that yeah. Is two Weeks Notice. Said, yeah. Right. Is that, which is better, Virgil Quits or Two Weeks Notice? Two Weeks Notice. <laughs> Unanimous. <laughs> two Weeks Notice. Uh, Virgil, Virgil Quits was my idea, actually. <laughs> See, <laughs> that, that goes back to when we were talking about titles. Um, yeah, but, but Two Weeks Notice leaves alive the possibility that he won't actually end up quitting, right? right? It's not nearly as final, for example, as final prey. But like, uh, like, like you were saying, though, that it, you know, it starts a clock tip ticking. Will he finish his last final case before, before the two weeks are up? And um, that was sort of the idea. But it, if I write that one, it's going to be a lighter book. It's not going to be a prey book. With, uh, with, um, I mean, it's going to be more stupid than you know, more stupid crime than uh, than well, than vicious, kinda, terrible that crime. That fits Virgil. He's had some. I mean, I think about what's the one with the tigers called? That's my favorite, Virgil. What's it called? Something other clause. Escape clause. Uh, Escape clause. Uh, C L A W S is my favorite, Virgil. Yeah. I love that one. Okay. Right, because I critiqued you on the next one in which the serial killer, you were imitating Agatha Christie and you flunked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Right, but when I told John that, he said it was too late, the book was already published, so there we go. The other thing is, I hate Agatha Christie, so I don't mind flunking her. <laughs> Although Agatha Christie was an interesting woman, she had she had some. Um, uh, she actually was married to an archaeologist who worked in the same area in archaeology that I did, which is over in the Middle East, and and I worked for 15 years in the Jordan River Valley. And uh, one of the stories I can't remember what her husband's name was, but he was Max Mallowan. Yeah, he was he was massively wealthy, and uh, one day they were traveling cross-country from Damascus to Jerusalem, and her car broke down, and according to the story, Agatha Christie gathered up her stuff, went to a local tree, laid down, and went to sleep right in the middle of the desert. And uh, that's when Max decided that he would marry her, because anybody who goes to sleep under those conditions were, you know, somebody worth marrying. Uh, and now she'd was, be the perfect archaeologist's wife. It's in her memoir called Come Tell Me How You Live, which is one of my favorite Agatha Christie's. And, you know, that's what she said. And, and one of the one of the stories about Max was that there was that there are all these things called the American schools in the Middle East. There's American School of Athens, American School of Jerusalem, American Schools of Damascus. And they were like basically archaeology and history and American influence and scholars would go there and study. And... Uh, Max left, uh, when he died, he left a bequest to the American school in Jerusalem and a uh, widespread celebration because, you know, they were talking about all they could things they could do with this enormously wealthy man's bequest. And it turns out he only left him at enough dinner, uh, enough money to have a dinner in his honor every once a year. So... <laughs> <laughs> 
So anyway, that has nothing to do with anything except that I worked there for a long time and I enjoyed the stories. So, so if you've if you've been coming here for a long time, you will know that John um, actually sponsored a or worked on a dig in Israel for many years um, with photography. So why don't you? We were talking about whether or not he was interest. His life was sufficiently interesting for him to write a memoir. Now I know I've read lots of memoirs that written by people whose lives are not as interested as John's, so I'm all in favor of a memoir. But the thing about a memoir is, is that I is that first of all I think the person who writes it has to feel has a sense of self-importance, and I don't really think that I'm that important. I, I mean I really don't. That's that's always been my sense of things. That when I was a columnist, one of the things about newspaper columnists is that they've got to have a sense of self-importance because why would anybody want to hear you talk? And that was my big problem. you got to write three columns a week. It's got to be about a, some topic of interest. And why in the hell would anybody know about three topics of interest a week? I mean, you know, like I can't even think about three topics of interest a year. And, and, and so I wasn't that good a columnist. But, but the same thing with a memoir. You know, you read, I had a happy child. How do you deal with that? You know? Uh, I mean, my parents were really nice people. They took care of us kids. All of us kids still get together for reunions. You know, we come from Iowa. You know, uh, nobody died early. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's, it's awful. Uh, I mean, uh, it would be an awful thing to have to try to, you know, come up with a good memoir from that. Uh, I can't think of anybody in my entire family who was deliberately cruel. Well, that's a remarkable thing. Yeah. But that's worth writing about, and your time in Israel would be worth writing about. And, you you know, you're a Pulitzer Prize winner, so, you know, that could be interesting to write yeah, about. I think you're—I don't think you— uh, I sort of don't no, think so. I, I'm not going to talk him into it, right? But it, but it would make a good, interest, a good opening paragraph of a book to say, you know, I, I had the most tragic thing happen to me as a writer— my parents were really nice people, and they didn't weren't mean to anybody. And uh, you know, like, what do you do with that? So that's very true. If you read Walter, I keep coming back to Elon Musk. But if any of you read uh, Walter Isaac's um, biography, Walter Isaacson's biography, it's had really interesting reviews. But a lot of it talks about his childhood. And you did know. he have a bad childhood? Yes. Okay. Um, and you know what that, that well, I think a person with Asperger's probably has a difficult childhood, regardless of how great his parents are, yeah, just because probably. it would be very difficult to you know to relate to other kids socially and so forth. So how many people here remember John D. McDonald? Okay. How about Ross McDonald or Ross Thomas? Are those people okay? I, I asked that question because as I was walking back there, I noticed that uh, Joe Ide has a book written about, it's not one of his... It's Raymond Chandler. Raymond Chandler. He right. wrote a Raymond Chandler book. He did. And I was thinking it'd be kind of interesting to write one book about... Uh, Each of the Rosses? No, just continue their series. Yeah. And and just uh, write one in their style. That would be kind of, I think it'd be kind of fun. Denise Mina wrote a... Um, uh, Raymond Chandler book, which is really different. I mean, she's Scottish, right? So um, her Raymond Chandler book, Where's Patrick? Because he and I did a program with her. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. It had all kinds of great lines in it. Did he Did he have a lover who was famous? Who, Chandler? Yeah. No. No, he drank. Who was the other guy? Raymond Chandler and who, there was another... Dashiell Hammett. Did he have a lover who was famous? Lillian Hellman, who was an author. In oh, her Lillian own. Hellman, okay. Right. You came here for the classics, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was the one that she was the one that was the enemy of Dorothy Parker. Yes. Okay. Very true. And they got caught up in the blacklist, you know. I mean, I feel like, you know, I was born in 1940, and so I was in junior high school when the whole McCarthy thing started in the blacklist, and I remember I was a freshman or a sophomore at Stanford when finally it all went away, and I thought, that's never going to happen again in this country, that we're going to get, you know, this kind Should of... I talk uh, about no, politics. Kidding. I know, I keep coming back uh, to it. Um, but anyway... Um, what I remember about Dorothy Parker, actually, is that great line, that if all the girls, if all the girls who went to the... Yale, all the girls who went to the Yale prom were laid end to end. She wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs>
She had a lot of great lines. Yeah. You know, there are, I mean, it's amazing. There are people who can, you know, most of us think of lines like that later, right? But Dorothy Parker was able, and Ben and Surf, there was a whole group of them at the Algonquin Roundtable that could do that, right? Ben and Surf went to Venice and he sent a telegraph back saying, streets full of water, advise. Which I've always loved. So, you know, they were great. So when you're when you're writing Virgil, who has some great lines, you know, do they come easy to you or do you have to sit around and think up? No, they uh, you know, the thing is, is you get into this kind of a flow and, and they sort of just pop out. A lot of them do. And uh, some of the lines, uh, some of the lines, I think, aren't original, frankly. Uh, I mean, I mean, they're 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 like they're like riffs on lines I've ever I've heard someplace else, and um, and and so they're they're not exactly the same, but but um, I was reading some website uh, that has quotes from authors and and a lot of the uh, and and the first one on my on on the list of quotes from me was a guy saying. I'm so horny the crack of dawn ain't safe, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a th- you know, are politics better than profanity? What? Oh Lord! And a, and the thing is, I'm not sure that's original. It seems to me that I've heard that someplace, and, and but I, I I've never been able to track it down from other than the one. Of, so we just moved into R-rated territory. They're probably going to throw us off YouTube <laughs> and Facebook. Oh, well. Right. Mm. I'm actually a very straight and sober person. Mm. That's true. (laughs) Very true. All right. So um, can we talk about the book that you were going to write that you're not going to write? Because I think it's quite a funny story. So, John, I got a a text from John earlier this summer saying he was going off to Oxford to do some research. And could I put him in touch with somebody? Which I did. Um, And so what was the point of your what was the point of your I was going to write. Uh, uh, I've had a, a, a long-term interest in archaeology. Uh, I sponsored this dig in Israel, which cost an enormous amount of money in for 15 years. And I, and I went there and dug every year, and I was a dig photographer for a long time. And so this is how involved I've, I've been in archaeology, pretty deeply involved. So uh, one of the big controversies in the world of archaeology is whether the Brits should give back the uh, Eglin mar- marbles, which are in uh, the British Museum. And uh, so I thought, okay, here's a great idea. Uh, we have an American author, goes to England. Uh, he is attacked in his hotel room, and he inadvertently kills the attacker. And the British courts determined that he hit him twice, but that's not true. He only hit him once, but the guy whacked his head on a on a... On a, on, a, on a ledge back behind him in the hotel room around the edge of a, of a fireplace, and that's what killed him. But they put him in prison for five years, and so he's in there unjustly imprisoned, and when he comes in, furthermore, he was engaged to a, to a really beautiful woman, a, 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 an actress that he had met during when he, one of his he's a very successful guy. His books are made into movies and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, he comes out and he's a very bitter man and, and he and he and he would like to strike back at England as an entire country at the same time if he could figure out a way to do it. And what he comes up with is he is going to help uh, a, a disgraced Greek colonel steal the Elgin, Mar- the Elgin marbles back from the British Museum. I had a whole story worked out. You know, a plane flies in. They go in on Christmas Eve, which is the only day that the British Museum is closed. They cut the marbles off the walls. They they load them up. They you know they have people locked. The few people that were in the museum, they have locked in a room. I got the whole plot worked out. You know, they're flying out through you know the jets over Europe, intercept them because they find out about it, and the plane refuses to land. And blah 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 goes on. So and then I signed up to make the key research trip to to Oxford to uh, to um, you know to do the final bit of research and look at stuff and and uh, go to the British Museum and look at stuff and and uh, uh, the British Museum is in London but I mean it was same all started the same kind of research and uh, I got there and I found out that the the 
Elgin marbles actually weigh like 356 tons. <laughs> and I thought we were talking about maybe five. You know? <laughs> because when I had gone to see the Elgin marbles years ago, what I remembered was a number of like figures that were mounted on a on a they're freeze they're yeah, freezes like, that go like along the on, a, on a wall up above you and you could cut those off and take them with you but it turns out that that's only like five percent of the elgin marvels all the rest of them are up and down these hallways and they're cemented in and stuff like that and you know 356 tons are you kidding me <laughs> i mean my my gang was going to get in and out in two hours and uh and so I had to ditch the whole story. And, and, uh, and uh, the other aspect of this, of course, is that, uh, is that I said, well, to my wife, I think I'm going to go off and do some research in London on the Elgin Marbles. And she said, you want anybody to come with you? <laughs> and so <laughs> what started out as a, you know, a fast in and out trip to uh, London and Oxford turned into an expedition. And, uh, and uh, there was a, a substantial upfront investment, let me put it that way. And uh, so what I did was I invented an entirely new book which required me to go to Oxford, which I am writing now. It's like right. it's a... In other words, the IRS would not look kindly on this trip. Yes. <laughs> the IRS is now going to take a hit, but what can I tell you, you know? Exactly. So it's a, but I love that. I mean, you know... Right. So that seems to me might have been a basic question at the outset. Which sort of, oh, could you I, actually I, list I, But I thought I, I thought I knew. Because, you know, I'd gone in there and I'd seen these things around the wall. I said, well, hell, you know, get a chainsaw and cut the suckers off. Nope, that's not going to way it's going to work. So. so what was the title of that book going to be? Uh, I think it was going to be called The Marbles. That was my idea. They hadn't told me at the, <laughs> the company what it was going to be. Oh, that's right. It wasn't going to be a prey book, right? It was yeah. a different character, yeah. right? So it didn't yeah. have to be like too heavy prey or something, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So have you have you gone down rabbit holes? You no, know, heavy prey is not a bad title. Yeah. Well, you can keep it for another book. Right? Yeah. Have you gone down previous rabbit holes over the course of your career where you've had an idea? Not, and not it like just that didn't one. Work? No, this was the not, first not, one. Not, no, not Would like that Would have taken, one. what, three B-57s or something to <laughs> no, carry the marbles? That's away? another thing is that I, I was uh, talking to my neighbor who knows something about everything. Uh, and and it, unfortunately, it's true. He's actually a CEO of a country company that does a lot of stuff. And he said, you know, John, that would take three 747s to lift that stuff out of them. And I said, that's a problem. You know, I was thinking... I was thinking 118 wheeler and a, and a you know, and a rent a jet. But it went, so... But have there been earlier attempts to write a book that have foundered upon reality? No, not really. I mean, the book that I'm writing right now, the one that starts in Oxford, thank God, <laughs> is uh, is a little bit of a fantasy. Uh, it's not exactly a fantasy, but but you know, like if you have a serial killer loose in the Twin Cities or any place else, Texas, New Mexico, you know, Scottsdale. And Davenport is chasing him and eventually corners him and kills him. Okay. So the people in Scottsdale will say, well, I didn't hear about this case, but I, you know, these things happen all the time that I don't hear about. Maybe I missed it in the newspaper. So there's a rational way of saying this could have taken place here and I just didn't know about it. And now I'm reading the story about it. The book I'm writing now takes place in Taos, New Mexico. Much of it does. But the entire town, and it takes place in 2023. It's very obvious from a lot of the stuff that it has to be 2023 because of road closures, uh, uh, construction at airports, all this kind of stuff that's going on right now that I went out and looked at, okay? But the problem is, is that the is that the events that take place are so large that the entire town of Taos, which has got about 6,000 people in the town itself, are surrounded by hundreds of MPs, military policemen, state police, and, and cops, and the entire place is closed down, and there are checkpoints that nobody can get through. Okay, so then you read this book in 2024, and you say, you know, I was here, and none of this happened. And I, w I would have noticed it because this is not Davenport going through on his own and catching somebody. This is a big national event. And um, so in a way, it's a, like a fantasy. And I, I don't I don't know how people are going to accept that. But I think you're overthinking that. I mean, it is fiction and it's OK, you know, if. But it is a little bit different. 
I don't know. I wouldn't have a problem with it if the whole city of Taos was shut down over, you know, whatever it was. You know, we recently had a very nice man who drove all the way here from Taos, New Mexico for one of our events. It's a long drive. But, um, yeah, so they they only had 5,999 people in Taos at that moment. <laughs> well, he would have taken him, what, it would have taken you about 10 hours? Yeah, yeah. I, I can drive to Santa Fe in seven and a half if I don't stop much, so... Right, so somewhere around in there. Right, I mean, have you been to Taos? Yeah, it's a beautiful town, isn't it? But very small. And yeah. Anyway, uh, how about questions? Because we can't really talk too much more about judgment prey. You've got the basic idea, right? The judge and the two boys are killed, and Lucas, because of the senator saying to him, you know, we need you to fix this because he's a federal judge, right? Yeah. And Virgil gets assigned, and off we go. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Uh, you know, no, not not that way. But uh, there have been some odd things happen along the route. Uh, for example, um, I once had a, uh, a, a sort of a perverted guy who would uh, uh, take uh, Polaroid photographs of his personal equipment. Let me put it that way. And, and, and would leave them laying in shopping centers so that because he knew that most women walking by a photograph that was faced up would have to pick it up and look at it. So that instead of exposing himself, he was doing it one step past that. Okay, so I write this, this is like a joke in one of the books. Get a call from a Key West cop saying, do you know this guy? <laughs> because <laughs> cause somebody had been doing it. Then there was the BTK killer in Kansas. Have you ever heard of him? The buy and torture kill thing? He told the cops he was a fan of the John Sanford books and that, and that, and that, and that he liked that. Uh. Then there was the case in North Carolina. Have I told this story? Guy's driving down a road. Here's a barrel, one of those metal barrels, and it's on fire, okay? Well, maybe that happens a lot in North Carolina because he didn't pay any attention to it and just kept going. And he came back, and here's the damn barrel still burning, and he thinks, you know, that's odd. I better take a look at it. And he looks in it, and what he sees are a couple of feet like this, okay? And so uh, he thinks he better call the cops, and he does. And um, the cops take this woman's body out of the barrel, which is half burned. They identify her as the wife of a guy who was having an affair. And um, the guy, uh, they thought the guy probably killed her. And one of the clues was that she was wrapped in a very distinctive bed sheet, which, you know, had a printed pattern on it. And if they could find that bed sheet, that, you know, they could nail it down. Well, they never did find the bed sheet. Uh, but... They put a lot of pressure on this guy, the husband, and his girlfriend. And one of my favorite characters is the girlfriend who thought, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And she fled for the state border thinking that would help. And, and because she was the kind of person she was, she took her goldfish with her in a big plastic bag. And, and so she fled for the border with her goldfish. But at any rate, uh, which the cops saw was unusual. They caught her but, um, and brought her back. So at any rate, uh, they then, because there's so much pressure on them, they then get a note that said, you will never catch us because we're operating under the rules of John Sanford set down in the rules of prey. <laughs> so, so, so the cops called me up and said, could you send us a book? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I'll send you a book right away, and I've never been in North Carolina at this point. Uh, and the, the interesting outcome for this case was that, the, was that they found the typewriter that the message was typed on, and it was typed on a guy who was not involved, they don't think was involved in the murder, but was a friend of the guy who think they did the murder. And so he wrote this letter for them on his typewriter and sent it off. And they charged him because they could get him, but not the other guy, not the killer. They charged him with accessory to first degree murder and they convicted of him and they sent him to prison for life. And the guy who did the killing never got caught. Don't type letters, Terry. 
<laughs> that guy back there. I, 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 you're talking through Patrick. You got to speak up. Uh, your thoughts on who would have the look and the attitude to play Lucas and Virgil? Uh, I, I'm not good at movie star names, but the but the guy. There was a time when he could play him. He he played um, he played a male model in in that in that cart in that movie where there are two male models kind of. Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie. Yeah, it was a comedy with a couple of big movie stars in it. Zoolander, Zoolander the blonde guy. Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson could have played Virgil, I think. Virgil, not Lucas. Yeah, yeah definitely, okay. definitely. And uh, but he would have to kind of tone down his act because he's kind of got this Owen Wilson act. That, that goes on, you know, he kind of a stupid guy. Uh, he'd have to, he, he can fix that, but he had the right look. And then um, the other guy whose name I can't remember, but played in Hotel New Hampshire uh, as the young kid. Nobody remembers the Hotel New Hampshire. Uh, I can't, I, I can't remember his name, but he he's a tall, really good looking guy. He, but he's so good looking, you'd have to beat him up a little bit. But that's not a that's not really a problem in the movies. You could do that. Uh, but the other guy that I thought of was the former basketball coach for the Miami Heat, Pat Ryan. If you know who Pat Ryan is, you know because he had those nuclear suits that he was always yeah. wearing. He always going around like this, you know, and doing this. And 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 uh, I I thought that I thought that he had the general look, you know. Rob Rob Lowe is the guy I'm trying to think of. If Rob Lowe is he doesn't look it, but he's actually a big guy, and and but he's he's very pretty. You would have to do some stuff to him to make you know. Got a question over here. Yes, you mentioned something about eventually stop writing. Would you ever pass the torch on to somebody like Lee Child did or someone else to continue? No, I, I wouldn't do that. Okay. Good, good. Thank you. Well, you know, it's interesting. We've got books in this store. I mean, these, these people have been dead for 10 years or 20 years. There are a lot of continued, you know, series. Um, but they don't say Tom Clancy, who's been dead for 10 years. The actual writer's name is at about four-point type, about this big, but it says Tom Clancy across the top. This lady. Why is it that... A lot of the writers are now... you got to talk into this because I can't hear you. I noticed Patterson and all of them are writing with other writers, co-writing. Why is that? Why do they write it with... You know, there's Why another... Why do they write co with co-writers? Well, part of it is that there's no way that he could actually write that many books all by himself. Are you talking about people like Preston and Child who are partners? No, she's well, talking about Patterson. Tied by because because there's a lot of money involved I mean, I mean these people have estates and and they they're dead so they're not they don't they don't have a, an opinion Pardon me? they do it because they would like to write an extra book Steve Barry is an example Steve took on a book with Grant Blackwood in June. He wanted to write about another character, but he didn't have enough time or enough energy to write his own regular series. Well, no, they're not quite the same, but that's just um, some writers make that make that decision. But that's different than a legacy writer, what John is talking about. When, I mean, Sherlock Holmes is a great example, or Agatha Christie. You know, there are still books being written um, you know Sherlock Holmes books. When the copyright expired, it meant that everybody. Could well, you know, the, but the other thing is the the other thing is is like I was saying, who reads John D. McDonald and, and who reads Ross Thomas and Ross McDonald and all those guys back then? I'm a fan as well as being a, a writer. I mean, I'm a, I was a big fan of, of of John D. McDonald. I think I could write a really good Travis McGee book, and and it would be fun to do. And and I don't think I'd make very much money at it. But I think it'd be a lot of fun, and I think it'd be a lot of fun to write a Ross Thomas book. And and uh, that's what you meant about Joe Ed writing a Raymond Chandler. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Joe I don't think Joe did that. 
you know, to make a lot of money. I think he did it because he, he is a Raymond Chandler fan, and he lives in Los Angeles, and that's uh, that's prime territory. It'd it just be fun. Have, you know? Yeah, Robert Parker wrote a Chandler. Uh, John John Banville, I think it was. Robert wrote, Parker wrote a Chandler, and then a lot of other people wrote Robert Parker's. It's still going on. It's still going on. Fact, he died yes. in like 2007. We have a Spencer coming from Mike Lupica in uh, December, I think it is. So, yeah, but part of that, I mean, John's right about the money, but a lot of that is fans. It makes fans very unhappy when a writer dies and then the character dies along with the writer. That can be a real blow to a lot of fans. So, you know, you can keep it going. It's a personal choice that every writer, I just was harassing John at dinner about having a literary executor, for example, because if you don't, then you can't necessarily prevent other people from going on and writing your characters. So I, we have a little free clinic here, legal advice. Um, but there are a number of authors who never thought about it um, that you know I've recommended that they look into it. It all depends on how you feel about having s your characters live on after you. That's a personal decision. Patrick, are there questions from? Um, there's actually a comment about the Elgin marbles. Um, <laughs> It's actually Elgin Marbles. Elgin? It's a hard Elgin. G. Okay, Elgin Marbles. Um, Linda says, supposedly the marbles were slated to be broken up to make streets. Uh, supposedly. And then she said, Elgin wanted to preserve their importance by creating plaster models. It was overwhelming. That's when he offered to buy them, uh, create them, and store them in a barn. Is that The public became interested. Elgin begged the government to use them uh, to start the museum. Supposedly. Well, there was a big, let, let me, I know a lot about this, actually, but so let me tell you what actually happened, that Greece at that point was governed by Turkey. It was part of Turkey, a legitimate, well, not a great government, but nonetheless a legitimate government, and Lord Elgin was an ambassador to the port, and his wife got interested, and in his money, he was Scottish, he had a lot of money, and they wanted to preserve the Elgin marbles, and they actually bought them from that government and ship them on a ship, unsurprisingly, you know, at that weight, back to England. So the Back to Malta. Yeah. Where they stood for, they were there for several years, I think. Right. But the point is that, you know, the Greeks are arguing that the British just appropriated them, and the British argument is that they bought them. And, you know, the fact that it wasn't a Greek government then, it was a Turkish government, it's not really the point. It was the government. So that has a lot to do with why there's this big controversy. The other part of it is, you know, was there, could the Greeks take care of it? They've now built a museum at the Acropolis that is quite a state-of-the-art museum. I've been in it, and now they say, okay, we could actually take care of them. It's the same argument about the Rosetta Stone. Should it go back to Egypt, to the new museum in Cairo? Because now, in theory, they could look after it. So, um, there's it, museum questions are all over the world, and there's a whole different bunch of factors involved. You know more about this than I do, but I just happen to know that about the Elgin Marbles. Yep. Well, that's 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 generally that's all true. Yep. Uh, thank you. Okay. Do you want serious or fun? What? How about a serious both? question or fun? I I don't care. Okay, we'll do serious first. Okay. Because you've written for so many years, is there anything about either yourself as a person or as a writer that you've learned that surprised you? Uh, I, only that I can keep it going this long. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and I started this in 1990, and uh, and I had had a whole career before that, so uh, that's that's a little bit surprising. Um, and uh, but you know, I don't know. It just seems like work to me. So it, you know, you're just going to work and coming back home. And the fun question, though, that could have been it. Yeah. Um, Virgil's nickname, I love. How did that come about? Uh, it just it just it just works out as a as kind of a uh, I don't I don't know what the literary word for it is but but you know it's, it's just alliteration. What? Yeah. It's alliteration. It's sort of alliteration, but alliteration has got to be more like you know what's a pun. You know, it just it just kind of pops up. It just kind of sort of popped up when I was writing. Well, you know, the thing is, is that is that is that in the first book when that came up, he had been involved in a shootout at a gas station with a guy and and 
and uh, he had fired 25 shots at the guy, and the guy had fired 25 shots back, and the woman said something like, you know, uh, you know, boys here would have killed him, and he said there must have been some pretty mean boys or something like that, and, and she said, well, that fucking flowers. Was and so, so that's just where it came from. It became his nickname almost, you know, and he doesn't like it particularly, but that's, that's, uh, it's just, it's just so sticky that that's what people call him. So. Very nice question, Christina. <laughs> yeah. Since the topic of collaboration was brought up earlier, any plans to do another one like Saturn Run with that? Uh, Good time. Interesting name. Uh, yeah. uh, no, you know, the, uh, not really. Uh, uh, the thing is, is, is that I read science fiction, but I'm not, I'm not good at science. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with science, like, like most people, you know, who took physics in high school. But, but, uh, I mean, all the science in that book came from Katine. It didn't come from me. Uh, Katine and I uh, got together because we're both photographers, and and uh, he's really a good photographer. He he's written a few books on on how to do really complicated chemical printing processes with film for film and uh, and now does it digitally but but um, I mean he's like in that world he's famous uh, and he's also got a double major in um, in physics and English from Caltech so he so you know like he was radically qualified to do that and I enjoyed doing that one book but that's really out of the line of what I do uh, you know the part that I wrote in there was all the stuff about you know what what the you know what the kids said and what you know the, you know you know the photographer said and what the guy said and what the ship's captain said and what you know these other people said and all that stuff about the ship which is pretty crucial to the story. That was all Katine. So, and I, I don't have another story like that that I really want to talk about or really want you know really want to tell. Actually, were you here for that event, sir? It was it was really an interesting evening. Um, he was a I thought he was a fascinating guy. He looked sort of like an Old Testament prophet. Yeah. Yeah, it's Katine, and I, uh, I don't actually know what his uh, birth name was. That's the, all, the only thing I've ever known him by, so. Anybody else? Yes, sir. When you took pictures in 1987, Virgil is a street cop, I believe. Did you envision the evolution? You mean Lucas is a street cop? Huh? You meant Lucas is a street cop? No, he's talking, about, he's talking about Virgil. Yeah. Uh -huh. He meant Davenport. No, you meant Davenport? Uh, no. I mean, you know, usually when uh, when you when you think about uh, people who are who are kind of your models, because I'm a fan. Like I said, I've been a fan all my life. Uh, people write series of ten or twelve books, and so you know, like I just wanted to get a book published because I had to send some people to college, and and well, really, seriously, it was about money. I'll, I'll tell you one other quick story. Uh, I won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize at the time was one thousand uh, dollars. The 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 newspaper gave me a fifty dollar a week raise. There's another twenty six hundred right there. Okay, the, the University of Minnesota cost twelve thousand five hundred dollars a year in tuition if your kid lived at home, and 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 I had two kids and a and a wife who all wanted to go to college at the same time. That's thirty six thousand dollars a year. I needed money from someplace, and and that was one of my. I mean, I was a good reporter, and I really enjoyed the work. And and so the one of my uh, one of my basic impulses for doing this was was money. And one of the reasons I did what I did was because, first of all, I'm a fan of that kind of fiction. And the other thing is, I just spent, you know, 20 years on the street in Miami, and in the Twin Cities. Talking to cops, looking at cops, looking at dead bodies, looking at you know, so that I had that background for these books. So, so that's where that comes from. And and I had, you know, if I could get one book published, I'd be happy. Then if I get three book published, I'd be happy. And then if I get seven books, that'd be a career. Uh, and so now I've got fifty eight. 57, something like that. You know, I never thought in my wildest dreams I never thought that was going to happen. So can you remind us how many, who were the people with you in the Miami newsroom? Because I think that was a remarkable constellation of writers. 
uh, well, it was uh, one of them was a woman named Edna Buchanan, who was a, kind of a famous uh, uh, cop reporter in Miami, uh, heavily armed at all times, uh, very smart, uh, uh, writ, wrote some good fiction along the way, uh, even outside the newspaper, and and the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but she was she was a she was a heck of a reporter, and uh, and also Carl Hyacin, who I think some of you are going to know. I, Carl actually worked for me for a while, and uh, when I was a, I, I spent a year or two as a as a city editor at the Fort Lauderdale Bureau, and I one time desperate for stories, I sent Carl out to find out what happened uh, to the horseshit at uh, Gulfstream Racetrack, and he and he begged me not to send him, uh, and uh, I sent him anyway because I was desperate for copy and uh, the story wound up on the front page of the big paper the whole paper because because Carl is sort of a genius and it was sort of a great story and uh, and it was my idea but uh, so, <laughs> but I couldn't have written it like Carl did um, uh, but we had a lot of people there who were really good writers most newspaper reporters could write the kind of books I do, if they weren't, if they if if they had the ability to focus for more than a day, uh, and and it's a true it's a truism that a lot of newspaper reporters have a first chapter of a novel, in a in a, in their desk drawer because the first chapter of a novel is easy to write, and but they just don't persist. That's the problem, and that's and people talk to me who work for newspapers. What do you do? you know, to get this novel done. You just keep writing it. No, no, what do you really do? Just keep writing it. I had a friend who, who was sort of an inventor in Hollywood, and, and he was a sound man. And, and uh, people said, you know, how do you get to be, what do you do when you're a sound man? And he said, you point the microphone as close as you can without it being in the picture. <laughs> and I say, no, what, really, what do you do to be a sound man? Point the microphone as close as you can to the actor without getting it in the picture. That was what he did, and and uh, he actually became sort of a famous inventor in Hollywood, and even got an Oscar for some of his inventions. But, but, uh, but some things are so basic and so simple. How do you write a novel? You persist. You just keep doing it. You just don't stop. And then your first one won't sell. Then your second one won't sell. Maybe the third one sells and doesn't get such you know great sales. The fourth one will get better sales. The fifth one will get better sales. And so on. But you just have to persist. Very true. Speaking of newspaper reporters, we finally got our Michael Connolly date, which is Thursday, November 9th. So Michael Connolly was a good reporter. and very good uh, reporter. And uh, is a good writer. He, he is a really good writer, and he knows what he's doing. Yes, ma'am. What was the book that you took off on? What number book was it that, that you knew that this was going to go places? I, I never really knew that until Rules of Prey. But uh, the, the thing is that I wrote a couple books beforehand, uh, pretty bad ideas, basically, and uh, they didn't sell. And uh, so then I sold the first kid book, and I got fifteen thousand dollars for it, which was one year at the University of Minnesota. And uh, and then I wrote I wrote the next book, and uh, which was Rules of Prey. And my my agent called me back and said that she had gotten a two book contract for me for four hundred thousand dollars. And and this was like in 1990 when that was more money than it is now. Okay, and then she called me a couple of days later and said that this movie guy had bought the rights for another 400. And so, like, this was probably 15 years' pay from the newspaper, and you know, like, from one book, and and I was gobsmacked. I mean, I I I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't. But you know, the checks arrived and I cashed them. So so. Uh, so send everybody to the University yeah. of Minnesota. But the, but the thing is, is that I mean, you know, weird things happen in the in the in the literary world like that. Uh, the same thing happened to Stephen King, and he's written about it extensively. About, you know, he he wrote I think The Shining, or maybe it was the one about the girl. Yeah, it was Carrie. Yeah, and he and, you know like. You know, the book sold, you know, 14 copies in hardcover, and they sold the paperback rights for $500,000. And, and, you know, like, this was even earlier than mine. This is, like, back in the 70s. And uh, and he freaked out. You know, like, what the hell does this mean? You know, it's just like it's just like you won the lottery. So. 
publishing is totally unpredictable, and that's because you guys are unpredictable. It's almost impossible to um, to judge, especially with a first novel, which ones are going to be. Although I can sort of tell by how much money the publisher is throwing at it. That's a clue. Um, but, um, you know, over the years, Patrick and I have both been surprised, haven't we, by books that, you know, we liked them. It wasn't, you know, that we thought they were bad books taking off, but we would. My, my favorite example is where the crawdads sing. I actually had her here at the store. There was me and Delia and one other person. And, you know, I read 100 books, and if I'd really been smart or, you know, been a genius, I would have had like 10,000 books for her to sign. Who is this? Delia Owens, the, oh. where the, your, your publisher. I finally <laughs> talked them into sending her here. But, you know, that wasn't a book that anybody expected to. It's just like, you know, Dan Brown, when he wrote the book before The Da Vinci Code, the name of which, what was it called? Angels and Demons, which was a... You know, I tried to persuade his publisher what a really great idea he had with the, what is it, an e no, that's Lincoln Child, an enigmologist. What is Dan Brown's guy? He has a, he's a, he has, he's a, a thing like that. I can't, yeah, but I can't remember what his, uh, yeah, but he has a thing like an enigmologist, but he's something very similar. Anyway. I could not persuade the publisher of Angels and Demons. What a great idea. So he eventually took uh, the Da Vinci Code to another publisher, and it just, you know, was a roaring success. But it took over the world for a while. It did, but you would have thought that, you know, Angels and Demons, the first one, would have been the book that would do that, but no. So it's just, you know, it's almost impossible to judge. What's going to what's going to take one of, the, one of the things that's going on right now is everybody's jumping in, up and down about AI and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And one of the interesting things about it is that they said, you know, all these jobs are going to disappear. You know, and one of the jobs they are talking about disappearing is mine. Uh, and I'm old enough that it doesn't worry me so much. But if I were 40, I would worry me. Uh, but we were talking a little bit about this at dinner time, And I think that most writers like me and like uh, Stephen King and like Michael Connolly and like, uh, you know, uh, Mick Herron and, and people like this are, uh, and, and I, I don't mean to sound vain about this, but, but the writing has a certain charm to it. And, and I can't think of a better word. It's just a kind of a charm that, that, that the, the reader picks up and that the writer can produce. And, and that, uh, that they like, and it's almost undefinable. But when you see papers written by AIs, it lacks that. They are flat. They they just don't know how to to create the charm yet. They don't, and I, I don't know what other word you would use to describe what goes on. But when I read one of the books, one of the people that I'm a fan of, it's always there, and you can usually pick up on it on the first page or so. It, it just feels right. And and how do you define that to a computer? And they don't know how you can find it. They could write really good sentences. You know, they're grammatical and all that kind of stuff, but they're flat. So Maybe you know. they just don't have a sense of humor. Dave Barry sat right here and said to me that an AI would never replace him because they don't have a sense of humor. I do remember the Dan Brown character who's a symbologist. That's the, see, now I've just proved to you that when you're old, it isn't that your memory fails. It just takes longer. You could hear it whirring away there, you know. No, I'm really serious. You know, that happens. And, you know, it just proves you don't really forget things. It's just the retrieval system is overloaded. There we go. Is there anything from the audience finally, Patrick? All right. There was one more question. A couple of years ago, you posted a, a sample chapter of a new character. And then abandoned that. I think it was a guy with a dog. Can you tell us what was going on? There? You know, that's still sitting on my on, on my computer, the front page of it. Guy with a dog. That's a great title. Yeah. Well, it's not the guy with the guy with the dog, but it's a uh, it's a German Shepherd, and um, our German Shepherd. Uh, well, never mind. But at any rate, uh, I, I like the character. But I don't have a story for him, and and I and I just kind of tired of inventing characters. But uh, but he also, in the end, struck me a little bit too much, like a lot of the characters that I don't like. Um, the, in in popular fiction now, 
I don't like military characters in general, and he was a military character. Uh, and the reason I don't like military characters is because I was in the military in the 60s, and I went to Iraq in uh, the zero zeros, whatever we call those. And my experience of the military and my research with the military is not anything like the superheroes who go around and kill dozens of people, apparently without any feeling about who the people are or any conscience about it. And I don't think the military is like that. I think it's it's a misrepresentation, so it bothers me. So I had this guy who was, uh, was going to be a lieutenant colonel. He was a lieutenant colonel when he retired because he's afraid they're about to make him into a colonel. And, and uh, I... I and, and he was going to help out some friends of his who were basically non-coms. And, and I had developed parts of the story. And, and one of the parts was is that, was that this one non-com, uh, his mother got ripped off by, by, uh, some, some, by, a, by a scamming group, a computer scam group down in, in uh, Miami who, who convinced her to send money to something, and they ripped her off for all the money. And so this guy got his non-coms uh, from Syria together, and they went to Miami. And what they found was was that this was some kind of a foreign group, which I hadn't specified yet, but God help me, I think they might have been from the Ukraine. But they, but they, they found that they had a huge amount of money there that they were just getting ready to ship out, so they stole all of it. And they had it in a uh, rental truck that they were driving around the south, you know, Mississippi, Louisiana. They were, they were hiding from these guys, and they wanted the colonel to come down and solve their problem because he was a problem solver. That's essentially what they wanted him for. So that's what the story was going to be about, you know, with, with a, some humor and crazy characters and gunfire and all that kind of stuff. But I just never got it done. I just, and I like the dog character as much as anything, you know. <laughs> the dog character is great. There we go. Well, I want to thank you all for paying attention. I think we're all starting to squirm slightly an hour in these chairs is about what we do. John, could you ask Sharon how many numbers we have so we can give away things? Five, five zero. All right. So I'm going to start with the band book shirt. And I hope that um, if it doesn't fit you, you'll give it to somebody who will enjoy wearing it. Could you pick a number between 1 and 50, please? 38. Yep. Sometimes, the, sometimes the number isn't. Oh, it's you. Yeah. All right. All right. You have a good shot at wearing a medium. Ha -ha. Wonderful. Here you are. Thank you. You are welcome. Enjoy. Is that the one time in St. Paul? Yeah, I was going to show it to you. I went to visit my daughter after she moved there. I uh, showed you last time. I recognize the, the camera. Yeah, from the Very nice. Yeah, I love the color.